My name is Mohammed Qasim. Um, I am the co-founder and CTO of a company called eFabless. And the, I will present today, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done around the, uh, the openness or the democratizations, the, the word that's being used all the time, but I believe it's being used here appropriately of the custom ASIC. And uh, we'll show you some history of that and some of the things we've done and some of the things that I think we'd like to do together. So my background is uh, analog mix signal circuit design. And I used to work at Texas Instruments in the wireless group uh, until 2011. And um, I have chips in many of the phones that can, whether you can like them or not, you know, they like basically you could hate the phones, but now you know the reason. Uh, for Nokia phones, uh, all, you know, a lot of them, the, that was uh, when Nokia was Nokia. And then uh, more recently where I was towards my departure, um, the Motorola uh, and Amazon um, uh, devices. It was a device called OMAP, and I was responsible for all the uh, analog mix signal on it. So I also, and the, pretty much one of the reasons I, I evolved to become who I am is tinkering. So uh, yeah, I blew up things until today, but a uh, long, long time ago, that's how it started when I was a kid. Um, I do have, uh, I open devices sometimes destructively and just to, to destroy them and see what's going on because I couldn't uh, tear them down appropriately or gracefully rather and end up buying another one just to use uh, or um, actually to understand what's going on in these devices and analyze how we can proceed further if we wanted to have an open source custom ASIC solution for some of these devices. So we believe, or I believe in, in the world needs custom ASICs. And historically the custom ASIC is uh, uh, cornered in the world of high capital. And it's actually, a lot of it was driven by the smartphone. So uh, the size and the power requirements and the performance requirements whether, and the leakage and battery life have driven uh, the world into designing things in different ways. Of course, the cost as well. And I have witnessed that at Texas Instruments myself because we would, uh, every two years, we have to come up with a new chip for the next generation of the phones with a different technology node from 180 nanometer in the year 2000 all the way to where I left, it was 20 nanometer in 2011. And there are reasons for that. Obviously, uh, some of that may be clear from the Intel life uh, cycle of kind of a Moore's law in reduction of the, uh, the size of the, uh, the transistor and the packing density. So <clears throat> the bottom line is the phone, in my opinion, drove the low power uh, need for compute. Today, we're coming back into the world of so-called Internet of Things, which a word or expression was used back in 2010 as well. But the way I see it is uh, we're getting that after integrating everything in the phone, we're dialing back and saying, well, let's chop it up and make it a bunch of things with different types of things, sensors uh, in, in these devices around uh, the, our life. So the, I would say maybe one of the best options that maybe an overkill of, an, of an, uh, an IoT device, if you can shrink that phone with a wand to a dot and just becomes with its cameras and compute and power communication available. <laughs> so there is, and you have, if you haven't seen it already, there will be, uh, we call people sometimes call it smart, you know, enabling smart devices. Some people call it uh, just automation, but it is exploding. And you look around, and then the, the, the term that's used, or I'd like to use, is that many of the devices are being converted to be citizens of the internet, and that means you give them the, 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 the connection and the smartness that, that to do the, to do so. A custom ASIC will be useful in enabling true customization of a lot of products. So today, uh, living with the, thank you very much. 
living with the custom with the standard AS, standard devices, whether it's ASOS, is kind of at the closest part of it, or, uh, or is something we have to live with because we have to live with it, and the cost of choosing to customize is uh, prohibitive. So it's out of the question, if, especially if it's a low volume product, something like on the right hand of the slide here, and so-called long, long tail, and uh, probably seen that expression many times. And uh, there will, the, the, the ability to customize or optimize the software and hardware together at the at that ASIC level or at the electronics level has not been available in the low volume world. It's only been available on the high volume, and you can see it from companies like Apple has been driving that many, many years. Uh, and then re more recently, by the way, they always did their, their silicon, uh, except that they chose to, to change the cores into the, they always did their silicon for the phones so if, uh, versus the laptops. But the reason for that is that they wanted to have a combination uh, of optimized hardware and software together versus the other approach, which general purpose compute, increase speeds and performance, and then you put a, a, a same stack of software on it. So there will be the need for the right size compute and power. And I, this is a, I make this uh, a big statement. And it, it, again, the, when you're sitting down trying to, when we were doing the smartphone discussions about the chips, uh, it was all spreadsheets uh, about what architectures and what uh, cost and power performance. And then you, you manually kind of have people with a bunch of people sitting around looking at, okay, we need to do this because we're going to optimize, get the same optimization, but for the application of the phone, uh, which was driven a lot with the video and multimedia and gaming in a sense, actually. So, and we need, in order to do that, one or two ways to generate these ASICs. It's either designers that know how to do it or automation. Uh, I think the world's going to be a combination because I think design uh, in, in electronics or the hardware or design in general is an art. And there will be some things through will be improved through automation to, for productivity reasons. But uh, the, the designers will believe that there needs to be a uh, significant increase, which means, you know, we need to, uh, to change how it's being done. And why do we care? And some people, uh, you know, as, as, as much as I, or as many years I've been in the chip development world, um, if you ask me that question, I wouldn't just give you these four bullets like out of the, like this, because if you're in that side, that world, it's just natural. So there are, there are many, uh, aspects or many ways to look at it and it does they're all these they're just a subset and they don't apply in all cases so it's not uh it's not going to be it's a, always the cost reduction or the performance uh or the size the or the intellectual property one thing i call is that when you design hardware from scratch like even a certain device in your hand any any device that will product uh, for the lack of a different Devices. I'm just going to hold the phone again, or something like the Aura Ring, the uh, the Smart Ring. The the knowing that you can customize the electronics gives you more flexibility in the form factor design. So, and that actually knowing that coming in, it allows you to make better decisions on the form factor, or the power, or the overall design of a product. If you know that this is a tool in your back, you can actually do that versus living with the existing Lego pieces, which they have certain sizes. You, they may not be uh, fit to be put in one place. And uh, a lot of people do the ASIC solution for you know, something like what's on the slide here, which is just uh, replacement of uh, some old solutions that, that logic doesn't exist which is still a big, a big deal actually. And, and it's not necessarily just, I'm not talking here, but today uh, in, in, uh, in the US, for example, this is worldwide. So they, what, what we wanted to do, or we wanna do together 
is to simplify the process and make it available to everyone. And that gets me to a point where um, if, if if people looked at the world before the app stores, whether it's Apple, uh, the Apple App Store or the Play Store from Google or others, in order to build software product and sell it, the, you, came in, you come up with an idea and you want to start putting it as a product and sell it. So just imagine what you need to do. So in the best case scenario, you know, you, you have the technical capability to do it all. And then now you need to find a customer. Now you need to find the time to do it and how, who's paying for it, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened with the app stores, they really provided certain pieces that made that explode and explode to millions and beyond, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands. And actually just maybe the numbers here, if you calculate them right, I may be off big time, but you can see the difference before the you wouldn't before the after the app stores you can see how many app, you know final product in form of apps show up the uh and then also so that primarily what happened is is uh the the market the sorry the, the sdks or the solid they made a structured standardized approach to do that with a certain minimum level of quality that's very important and the second is there is a business process so the, the, the developers can follow and go through it. And the third is connecting to customers and knowing what, <clears throat> what the market actually needs. Now, in the app stores, it's a little bit tricky because most people, <clears throat> they think and guess what the market needs. And then because you can actually put it in the marketplace, you see what happens. So I always give the example of Angry Birds just as a, you know, you know, it's a theoretical thing. I made it up, but actually it's a good uh, way to look at it. Is that if you imagine the uh, developers of Angry Birds, maybe some, some is here, I don't know, standing in front of an investor saying, I want to develop this game with a slingshot shooting birds. And it's going to have on the other end, the two movies, Angry Birds 1 and 2, and it's going to be like massive, massive uh, household name. Um, nobody knows what would have happened, but I'm claiming that it would have been hard to make the case for investment for this. So, but because of the app stores and the, the capability that exists, they just do it. You just start to do it, put it, and then have the market judge. And then I think this is the same approach if <clears throat> will apply to hardware if we do it right, whether it's based on custom ASIC or not. So we can do the same. We believe we can do the same for the uh, uh, design, and we can extend it to a large number of people as well. So, if uh, for for those of you who are familiar with just the high level, without getting into the very detail, is that there are a lot of shackles and a lot of barriers. Uh, one of them is money, but actually, even if you have it, it's hard to get the rest. So you have to get software uh, from, soft, from software companies. You have to get access to the technology information from a foundry. And even if you get that, maybe the money is going to help you for finding, making the manufacturing possible uh, for you to try something. <clears throat> Let alone the NDAs, which are very interesting because you don't sign an NDA with someone who, don't, who you don't know or you don't know how to sue. That's how the companies look at it. So <clears throat> it's very hard to, to get that signed and done, no matter, even if you sign it. So <clears throat> in, the, in the chip world, if I wanted to uh, apply the same example of an SDK uh, in the software, I'll have to at least look at these six items here. So I want to know, you know what's, what's out there, uh, what, what, what people need. Uh, I don't, for, for a given chip design or a system, I don't have all the knowledge myself, one person, you know, so we probably need other people. And they need blocks. So if you're building a chip, you're starting not from scratch. So you're going to, if you're familiar with the, the process, you're going to find that if you need even a peripheral like SPI, it has, that's an IP, that's something you need to acquire, it has cost. Example also ARM IP or ARM cores. 
the EDA tools, the uh, so-called the PDK. And the PDK, I'm just, uh, without having any graphical illustration, it's basically uh, a bunch of models that represent what can be manufactured. So it's a way to have the designer to know in their hand what's possible to manufacture. So you, you don't do something that's not manufacturable. And it's represented in a bunch of models and files that gets uh, work along with the EDA tools. And then after doing all that, then the manufacturing itself costs money. And if you manufacture it, you want to test it. So on the right-hand side of this slide, I say useful. I actually mean to end up in a product. So uh, that's a very important piece versus a test chip uh, for tinkering, which is a great thing to do. But I, as I go through and move forward, uh, I'm gonna, you're going to find that uh, I vouch a lot for that because it lifts up the ecosystem big time. There are examples of partial solutions that are around the world. So people will say, I want to go there, do create shuttles or aggregation. And uh, there are systems that are, would uh, have less of a uh, criteria or to have you sign an NDA. Or, so they exist, but they don't provide a solution. They, most of them, they come with the shackles of academic uh, purposes. So if you want to do this, and even if you're in a university and then you, you have access to all this, Actually, this is an, an, a phenomenon that I see with professors. Uh, not all of them, but just call it 20% of the professors that I talk to. They say, I have everything. Well, so this is the effect of, yeah, you fly F-16s, you, you get trained on them, and then you get out of school. There are no F-16s out there. You can't get them, okay? You have to go work somewhere else. Or, you know. So um, it's just sad to be, or it's, I think it's not sad. It's not... Um, consistent with the progress of the industry to have this captive to this to this date or to at least three years ago until we all started uh, to be captive within a certain subset of uh, of, of boundaries or, 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 or I'm going to say subset of people but it's basically within boundaries of uh, access money or otherwise so so when we started, um, I wanted to solve the problems one by one, but I, I really, when I started, I did focus on the EDA aspect. I said, first, let's check to see if there are software out there that actually can people do anything useful with it or good. Uh, I was comfortable with that because when I worked at TI, believe it or not, so because my team, we were working on the first, the, we were the design team that works on, uh, on, on any technology first time. So everything is inaccurate. Simulation models are not good enough. Tools are, uh, you know, you have to hack them a lot. So, you know, so I'll, let's say I didn't think that the open source software that's out there is any different. Actually, I thought it's maybe better because I can actually talk to other people without, with, the, yeah, with the freedom of uh, uh, openness. So I, I literally traveled around the world, identified first who did something successful with a simulator, a router, uh, uh, synthesizer, or whatever. So I, I went and basically sold them, let's say, let's get together and do something to make real chips and real products. There was a lot of skepticism that eventually worked out. <clears throat> uh, now, if you notice the small text here, which is something that I'm not intended to, for you to, to read it uh, right here, but it's, there is a word open, open, open source is just all over the place. And that's actually where we're going to go. So as I mentioned, um, I, I looked around, like literally, uh, I had a collaborator with me who we had this massive table of matrix of uh, what tools exist and what they can and cannot do. And, uh, and actually trying them. So that was the start. And you can give these tools to anyone, to anywhere, without the permission of anyone. And anybody has an idea, they can use them right away. And I applied that on analog and digital. And the reason I'm putting this specifically here, because uh, there is sometimes perception that the analog is actually less served. It is less served in terms of um, uh, quality of our user experience, 
but it is there. So it's actually, as a matter of fact, it's easier to, to work with it in open source. So and this is kind of obvious. Why should be open source? But it, it's hard to actually do it in the, in the semiconductor world to actually make that case. Because it's actually, I'll say this, and I'd like to say it publicly, and I keep saying it, is that uh, the semiconductor industry is the industry that least benefited from its own progress. So uh, we increased the compute capabilities and the, the ability to, you know, the computers have evolved significantly, but the productivity and the ability to generate chips and the way we do create chips haven't changed for decades. So, and I can challenge that, you know, in, at the whole, uh, at the bigger picture level versus uh, uh, just a specific uh, design. So we all know that. So when we did this, I started saying, well, let's, let's go do some ASICs with the tools first to take some risk. And we did a few of them. So this was uh, just a, a few analog blocks put together with this SPI around them. And uh, it was done with, an op with open source uh, tools. Slide changed. Oh. Yeah, this is a second chip. It's actually one of the big transformative chips in the whole discussion that's come forward. Uh, is It's a RISC-V microcontroller. And again, the only thing that's up, actually two things are open source here at a high level. The core, which was a RISC-V uh, core. And then the second is the, the actual chip, the top level. But because of the time when we did it, there were no open source analog blocks. So we just had to live with it. Um, the, this is another version of that. So we, they were actually uh, intended to actually uh, 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 blaze the trail and say, okay, it's possible. Um, we, we had, uh, once we did this, we had actually, because of it's an open source chip, the security aspect of that appeared. I wasn't actually very privy to that and I learned it over time. Is that, uh, so we got approached by NAC Israel and they, their approach was like they found this, you guys have the only open source actual chip that we can use for uh, uh, as a root of trust to verify. Now, obviously to verify that doesn't have Trojans. There are you know, holes in that argument because you can verify that a chip design or a code that doesn't have any Trojans, but by the time it gets manufactured, you, you need to trace out the supply chain all the way to know that's actually clean, but in that case, at that time, that was the first chip, so they, they used it as a cool processor to do that. And their case was it's a small chip, inspectable, I can prove that it's clean, uh, and I know what's in it exactly. So we designed these uh, four chips, uh, new open source tools, uh, with no, no intervention from uh, or use for any. This was actually an important th thing is that we needed to stay clear of any contamination because to keep things uh, clean. Second thing, <clears throat> I mentioned the PDK. The PDK is, uh, it's the library. Call it the library for now. Um, if you compare to the FPGA world, it's, uh, you have the software that comes with the FPGA plus the, ten, the library, the target library and the FPGA. So the PDK is a similar thing for the foundry. So they're long in a very interesting twist of events. Uh, we partnered with Google and Skywater, uh, the foundry. And Skywater, actually, for the background, it is the foundry that is uh, in spin off of Cypress. So, Cypress is products that are P SOC specifically, for example. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with it, they were manufactured on Skywater, especially the Skywater 130 that's uh, mentioned here. So the results of that uh, were led to another foundry to, to follow through and Global Foundries, which actually created two things, a small foundry doing something and a big foundry, the second largest in the world. So these were two score points made other people question, uh, how come? You know, why anybody that comes later is going to be the third and then the next one is going to be fourth so the third one was the ihp from germany um, they did it on their own uh, and they came they made they saw the, the the benefit of that and the benefit is that more people will actually be able to design and statistically speaking that means more potential business so so 
I like to use the word viral here because that's what happened when the PDK was published for the first time when in June uh, 2020. And I'm just, this is, you know, uh, compared to other open source projects on GitHub, and you can tell the span here is about seven years, but that's what happened in a, like less than a month. Um, so it's almost like the world was waiting for that to, just to statistically, you know, the, the, the download aspect, you know, of this typically take, you know, tens over a year or maybe a month. It, it was happening at like 300 times a week uh, or uh, for two years. So it's a lot. And we get, you know, a lot of people are assembled around it. And this would be an interesting community because the discussions are around the chip development different aspects, chips or software related to it, or embedded hardware or compute. And I encourage everyone to go there because it's, uh, it's unique. Uh, you'll, uh, if you're used to the NDA world of the chip development, you'll be shocked how much of that is actually no longer under NDA for these technologies. Um, so the marketplace, and I won't press on that too much, but the objective, at least from a company like eFabless, was to reach to that level where you have everything you do but also I want to give you ability to monetize that because that's an important piece uh, and reach the market. And it's still in its uh, start, so we're still working on that. And the goal for this would be something like this. It would be the community would be able to develop what they think are good ideas and they put them in the marketplace for the market to judge it. Or the other way around, which is system companies that want to develop chips, they can do that uh, either themselves or through the community. And I mean here community, I mean every, everybody that, whether individuals, universities, companies, big or small. So one, uh, speaking of the SDK, so it's building a standard uh, to build on. So we did, uh, this was uh, a part of the, the project we did with Google, is to build a, a baseline template chip that's available and it has, uh, a standard interface in the middle that the designer just focuses on it. If you look at it this way, you start, you don't, you start, you don't start from scratch. Number two is that the knowledge required to develop something goes down. So you'll focus. I, I, I honestly think so. ESD reliability, IOs, all these are things we have to have to expose the function of the thing we designed to the world. So you, you may actually have the perfect chip, but you screw up the ESD or the IOs or, or it's not gonna work. And it happened to us actually, but uh, having that designed uh, as a starter helps. The, and then we created a way to integrate that. And because we have an interface, standard interface, we can put a board attached to it. And then that board, you can actually plug it into USB and actually start with it. So it becomes, and I have that board, I'll pass it around, but it's, uh, this is the most recent version of it. But uh, it, is, it actually helps to simplify the process, to start from a known point and work uh, uh, your way out of there. <coughs> this, this chip actually is a RISC-V microcontroller by itself, a bare bone. It has a logic analyzer, it has some peripherals, and it works with an external flash. Everything in it is open source. This is the, it was, the tools were open source, the PDQ was open source, the entire design will be out there. And if you haven't seen that chip, if you go to GitHub, that, that uh, link, one of the things that out of the program with Google and was in order for these things to be successful, we needed to have some sort of reproducibility. So if it's just the design and thrown out there and you look at it, it's actually useless almost. But uh, having the intermediate steps and the files and the documentation. So this was actually one important thing. So we put a standard structure for this. It's not perfect, but uh, it led into people starting putting more information. And the, the, the working with the Google team was interesting because coming from the chip world, like the hardcore uh, hardware, well, not hardware, hardware chip, specifically the chip, with the traditional development process working with the Google team, the software guys, 
that are very saying, okay, I don't know how to deal with the DRC or all that physical stuff. I just want it to work and it be tested with CI. Some really cool things that have never been applied on the, on the chip development cycle. So it's very, very uh, cool to actually have that knowledge diffusion coming uh, both ways. So you end up with this and you get a board and this is actually a picture of the most recent board. We have two types of parts, uh, packaging, CSP and uh, QFN. And one of the events, call it unfortunate or fortunate, we had a bug in the IOs in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, one of these uh, chips. So actually a lot of the designs got in, became in, stuck in jail. So this, uh, we came up with a way to uh, understand, it's almost like tweaking, playing with a key lock until you, you're able to unlock it. So we did this with software. So we had a nuclear board from SD that actually would characterize the chip and would de determine what tweaks we need to make in the software to make the IOs work. So we ended up being a tester. So we developed this board. So now not only can you just uh, do it, you can test it. And then the white little uh, daughter board or breakout board here, uh, it was interesting because not every, speaking of simplification, if I give you a, a bunch of parts on the CSP, that's not simple uh, to, if you, if you really want to simplify it, depends on who you are, obviously, but, uh, or what you're passionate about. But if you really want to make it simple, you need to, so we give both. So we end up with a breakout boards and parts. Um, mostly on the left of this, this is actually just how the most recent testing process that we applied just with the, the Digilent, the 82s um, kits. And, uh, you know, in this setup, I put a dedicated computer. This is running Python. It will just go through the, the, the chips uh, uh, functions and verifies them. This is one of the examples that was done with a Stanford student in a course, and which is actually was possible because it was uh, the time required to design was actually possible to fit within the course of cycle rather than starting from scratch. <clears throat> These are, I'm just flashing them here to show, you know, the, one of the new things that have been done here is the silicon validation. So typically there is verification dashboards and test benches. This one is jumped all the way to uh, doing it with uh, the setup that I just showed earlier, but it confirms that, that we have to do it to confirm that what we did, what we verified in simulation is validated. We did it in two different chips uh, through different foundries. So, and this is part of it to show that you have a baseline chip that's actually, you know, if you have doubts about it, it's not good. So now uh, we came to, you know, after all this abstraction of knowledge is important and the and I'm, this is again, doesn't exist, but I'm just using it for, uh, I wanna get to the right hand of the slide, okay? So now uh, there is a flow, that software that takes from RTL, uh, very log to the GDS, to that block, generates that. Well, if we go backwards a little bit, what can I do uh, more? So we used things, different things uh, to put in there to make, easily interfaceable to what people know. Now, first we started with that flow. It's a bit, it's an open source digital uh, design flow uh, back end. It will take you from the very long all the way to GDS. And usually it's, you have to tweak it and do some, you know, configuration changes and so, but you ask, uh, based on the discussion, I'll kind of use the comment from uh, Tim Ansel here from Google. Again, I don't know what the DRC is. I don't know how to fix it. I don't care. I want it just to get done. And even if a bigger area or lower performance. So if you think this way, this is against complete against the DNA of a semiconductor industry, you would actually enable, you know, conservatively, I'll say a thousand X more people uh, to do it because the, it becomes like software compilation. And a part of the, that, actually thanks to our the persistent interaction with Google, is that 
we the the bottom part of the chip here which we call it the management area this is the risk 5 uh, core plus the peripherals it was generated by light through lightx and and uh, it's a, it's you know for for those who don't know lightx it's the ability to actually through python interface to write or configure or target different uh, designs to different fpgas so we just added another target for asic and it was interesting to actually make it work and it's not fully flushed as uh, something that's out of the box usable but we've proven the concept and we uh, some things are still work in progress including this uh, concept one other way of abstraction one of our community members his name is matt Venn, created tiny tip out and that took it to a different level and said, okay, I don't, I don't want you to even do very log. I'm just going to give you a schematic editor on the top left, and you hook up a few things with, certain, with a lot of restrictions, and you only have certain small area or this this area, and then I'm going to take this and stick it into 250 ways inside the big chip and multiplex them. So this way, actually, we have high school program that did that, and you end up with, and we started thinking it's going to be a high school. But after doing it, uh, it, it's actually pretty cool to sit down for two hours and try something, whether it's your high school or not. So it became very appealing to many people, including myself. So there was uh, the, the, in order to, to innovate, you need to keep tinkering and try and fail and learn. So there was a, a bigger issue here, and if I'm going to do this with silicon, it's a little hard. It costs money, and the this is where the uh, the Google Open Silicon prototyping program came in place, and this was over uh, 22, 21, uh, 21, 22. Uh, Google funded a manufacturing of uh, shuttles for. Uh, using the, uh, the, the the environment or the tools that were available with uh, an interesting condition is that there's no judgment unless except that your design is clean manufacturable you it's a lottery and people get into it and with some with the also restriction that's open source everything is open source which is a good restriction so since they chose that an example here is that one of the things we did is that since we fixed the tile size, this this shot here is the mask, the full mask. So we divided that into the 42 slots. Two of them, the black, the gray ones are gone to the foundry. But when the first shuttle was open, it was very very quickly populated. Uh, and just in case you think about it, the first time it was like a little bit of a if we open this to the party and say, okay, we're going to have ASIC design sitting inside this party, how many people will show up? It kind of, you kind of, you be nervous. So we got the first hint very quickly. The, the, from companies, individuals, it was great. So to just see what's happening. And this is, uh, this is number one and number two. And then you can see that people use it differently. So this is different designers do different things. And just for fun, after I got this, I just put them together and side by side. They're not the same aspect ratio, but it was manual sort in a sense. It's actually important to say that the simplification worked. So about one, uh, many people, sixty percent were first of the people on the doing design was uh, designs were uh, first, uh, first time coming from either software or the PGA world or chip designers that never did before, never had the chance, and you know about one third identify as software developers. The, the, we did a couple of test chips in the beginning. And then if you see here, there's MPW one through eight, and then there's one, it's an MPW zero for another foundry. So this process worked with uh, growth uh, over time. So more and more people actually uh, do and show up and do designs. It was another interesting point when we tried another foundry. So you would have, uh, 40 slots in one manufacturing run and another one in parallel. Uh, that was a little bit of a part, two parties at the same time. And it was overwhelmingly uh, uh, booked. Well, the booking here is a lottery, so 
So how many people in the lottery was much, much larger than 45, which is 45 over 40 versus uh, in, in a 90 uh, or 88 over 40, and it keeps going. This was a little bit of fun. So we made sure that we do this on every chip. So if you do it and look at it in the microscope, you find that. And this is actually, uh, it was um, decapped and, and imaged by John McMaster, a community member who is doing these things just in his garage. And, you know, just many people have gotten into it, companies, as I mentioned, and universities and individuals. These are some examples of the work that's been done. And it w because we don't say, we didn't say who does what, people came up with their own variety of applications. So, and then you can, uh, take a look at this, uh, you know, offline. But I encourage you to do that because you'll you'll see the full design. This was an interesting one because you actually get the whole thing to work on a video. This is an, they developed an FPGA, and they this is an FPGA with the software to implement what we're seeing here as a demo. So the, the, the so this chip on the on here is is an FPGA, but uh, it's a small one. And, uh, you know, people can, you know, there are different, you know, some people do radiation hardening designs or they're not, radiation hardening or, or, or extreme environment design can be done in a, uh, in either design or process. So people, you know, we've seen great things, including the, the, what I mentioned here, Matt Ben, he created a course, a zero to ASIC course, you've probably seen it. And, uh, but again, smaller designs, multiplexes, and they work, and it's kind of cool. If you want to go see a lot of these projects, you just go to ethos.com slash projects. And again, you know, forgive the, 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 the different levels of documentation and, and cover it, but it's it's large number enough that you'll see, you'll see and you'll actually learn from. Uh, now, we found once this happened, People said, oh, I don't want to open source my design. I want to use these things. I don't want to have a lottery. And I want to go on my own schedule. So we created something called Chip Ignite at uh, Etablis. And this is what brings me to the funding part. This is a commercial <coughs> uh, offering that brings the same technical offering that's in the, in the program that was done, funded by Google. But it's actually, um, and I'm, I'm, the only reason I'm mentioning the numbers here is just because I spoke about funding in the title. So it's not like I'm trying to sell here in a sense in a direct way. But just wanted to show that it is because of the optimization of the, the, the structures and making it uh, the mask single tile and several things gone through to make that go to that price. And that price is not for area. So people compare this thing to say that's uh, compared to other you know, how many millimeters do you have? Well, I, I'll say this is a 10 millimeters squares that have electricity and plumbing and a frame and you get in and finish rather than just having a, an empty lot. You have to deal with it. So, And it's designed to also uh, jump into low volume. And we're still, you know, p making that work even better. Now, if you calculate, so $20,000, you get 1,000 parts, that's 20 bucks. That's a very expensive proposition compared to a unit or a part that you buy for equivalent function. The only difference is actually it's your part. You can, and this is including all the masks and everything. There is nothing, no other costs. So uh, the, the exercise of knowing the value is important. We, we did uh, a bunch of uh, options. You know, some uh, you know, people asked for a bigger design uh, space. So, and there is a version of this analog and digital. And again, it's the same and yeah, same interface. One of the things that actually led to the cost to be low, or we don't, the package is the same. So it's the same package, no change in package. Yes, less flexible, but uh, if, if it's not working exactly, then it's not, that solution is not fit for you, but it solves it for a lot of other people. And then there's the IP. This is interesting because even though in the open source world, there's a lot of things that are going to happen but we created a way to mix between the open source and not. So I'll tell you that the chip that uh, Caravel, there is a version that's coming out soon, 
it's ARM based. So instead of a risk five core, it's an M zero. And uh, that was interesting because ARM wanted to do that, yeah, except it's not going to open source the design. Just the, the, the hardware is going to be available. The chip uh, itself is going to be available, but anything you put in it, it's yours. And we're working on that library, and this is a community effort. So I will, you know, if we talk offline, it's going to be call to action, say, we need to, knowing that you can actually do it, uh, we need to develop these things. Now, here's the, the twist. So after this full declaration, uh, eFabless uh, Synopsis is an investor in eFabless, equity investor. How did that happen? How, you know, what's the incentive? So because of the community of designers that are around us, uh, it was very interesting proposition to say, I, as a company, Synopsis wanted to get ahead of that and said, I want to put my tools in the hands of the community as well. And now the open source EDA is considered an, a funnel opener. Many, many, many people can use it. Hundreds of thousands can use it. And then you can, if you want to have that option. So, uh, so you'll, you'll, uh, this is going to come in more news and it's going to come around it. Uh, we're going to be adding additional features for that, uh, for, some, for synopsis, uh, uh, support. The, these are examples just for what something we did with high school and a community college and for education's purposes. And, and just for the interest of time, these are all examples that are good and they were first time uh, happening. Um, one last thing here is that in this five minutes, I'll say, well, okay, it's still 10K. So uh, I did the first campaign and uh, Josh uh, held that against me and somewhere else, but uh, it's called clear. So. I said, okay, let's, uh, let me start with that. So in literally like a couple hours, I said, okay, well, let's have this uh, program where we're going to make a very small FPGA that's completely open source and call it clear. And I wrote the, the page for it um, in a couple hours with some pictures and examples. And it, it wasn't a bore worm. It was intended to say, okay, I can actually come up with the money to make my own idea and fund it. It wasn't overwhelming funding, but it was funded. So now if I didn't have the money, I can go crowdfunding, get market support or community support and actually do it. This was done by eFabless itself. The, this one was done by another team and uh, it's actually the chip is in the fab right now. Again, uh, call them test vehicles because we're still starting, but I do encourage and I, and I think we're gonna find good ways to work with uh, crowd supply and uh, making that even easier uh, and then you'll find examples a lot of examples here twitter has been a rich medium to keep doing these things on them and then uh you know i'll, I'll keep that just to just to, to to see what's going on uh, around the community this was a picture just i wanted to show this is actually temperature testing for the board that uh were uh, uh, because we wanted to to have a complete setup with a camera that they can remotely actually play with it, and you can you know, you know take that chip for a spin even if it's not. Uh... So I think I'm done uh, at least for now, and then I can answer any questions now or through conversations. I'll be happy to. But uh, the one message I'll give here is actually uh, go do it. Go, uh, you know, as the slides uh, are available, go to the, the github.com slash eFabless and get started. When I say get started, you literally clone a repo, run a make command, and you'll get an example from A to Z done in front of you that you can actually do it again and get your hands with it. And there's a lot of community support around it as well. So it is uh, no longer an enigma. Or just you can start and then modify from there. Thank you.